so that you will know how to develop the spiritual will and what is mental will. The difference between the two is simple. What occurs in time is mental will. What does not take time is spiritual will. All thoughts are mental will. Everything thing you think out and decide is mental will. What comes intuitively as a gut feeling is spiritual will. It doesn't take time. It comes suddenly at once you know something. Every one of us is experiencing both every day. But we ignore the intuitive <coughs> will, we ignore our spiritual will and only follow mental will. Just shift that little bit. Follow your gut feelings. Follow the sudden intuitive feelings you get and let the mind not override it. Normally when you have that feeling, the mind thinks you out of it. Let it not think. Tell the mind, carry it out. Your spiritual will will develop, mental will will fall and follow it. Very big change will take place in your life just by doing this. So when you develop your spiritual will, automatically the mind becomes so subservient to you that you use the mind like you use anything else. Use your mind, use your body, use your sense perceptions and it's a given gift to you. We did not come here to suffer, we came here to have a new experience, to enjoy it. We never came here to have suffer and cry and why are we here, what bad karma we have done, what have we done. We are talking completely, totally different from what we came for. We came for an adventure, high and low, in a new type of place, new type of experiences. That's what we are here for. And we are thinking there is the only reality, we belong here, we will die here, we are born here, nothing else. All untrue. The truth lies inside us. Find out that the body is only a temporary cover for a very short period. And if we know what happened yesterday, we can remember some things. Memory is very limited. At my age, next month I am going to be 92, memory is even less. So we can remember very little things. And we can't remember what happened, what breakfast we ate 10 years ago, or even 2 days ago sometimes. So memory is so poor, we can't remember what happened before you we were born. Not in the physical body. But if you are not in the physical body, but you are in that astral self, behind the eyes, you can remember what you were doing before you were born in the physical body. Memory becomes so sharp. You remember your own life in that form, pre-existing before the body was even born. It's a remarkable experience of memory itself. You will notice that you have had several forms of physical forms, but the same astral form for thousands of years. The astral form is supposed to be living between 1,000 and 3,000 physical shapes. So you can imagine when we withdraw our attention behind the eyes, that form which we think is imaginary, that contains all sense perceptions, contains thoughts, contains the mind, contains life, contains the soul, that form has a long life. If you go even further, the deeper meditation done with the astral self, you can go to the causal plane, which is the mind itself, mind and soul alone, you will find you have been with the same mind a million of years. Millions of years of life each mind has, it carries all the impressions of millions of lives on it, the same mind. It's not a new one. The brain is not the mind. The brain is merely the physical body containing the experiences of the mind into built into our cells into a system. It's just a way of integrating all these things in a physical form and in an astral form. Now imagine we have the ability with these simple directions which are given to us by those who have experienced them, by the saints and mystics, they have told us that you can find the truth of yourself. You can even find what the soul is like by going beyond the mind. There's a very different way of traveling beyond the mind. Mind you can go with your effort, with some help, some guidance, so you don't go in the wrong areas of the astral plane. The heavens and hells both are there. 
the great master's time, there used to be a BB, there used to be three BBs, three ladies who used to serve him. And uh, one was tall and hefty, strong. So in the battle for the position around the great master, she took first position, I think because of her weight and her size. And she took over the great master's house, lived with him, took care of him, took care of his wardrobe, took care of everything, kitchen. The second baby was a little thin but tall and she took the next best saver for the great master taking over the kitchen. The kitchen was just attached in a separate little place next to the great master's suite in the big house. So she did the kitchen. Third was short but did the most meditation. So she couldn't fight these two. So she took the third position of making chapatis and working in the langar, in the common kitchen there. So she was a cook there in the common kitchen, sang shabat along with the others and worked very diligently. The first one got a good experience of the astral plane. So was the second one. Third one went beyond because her love and devotion for the master was so strong that nothing would shake her faith. Now I'm telling the story of this third baby who was not living in the house, not in the kitchen, in a separate small little hut, very close to me and my family because we had a house next to us. We lived in a slightly bigger house in the Dera next to us. One day, this baby started crying. Loud, crying loudly in the little hut. We could hear it outside. And she wouldn't open the door. We knocked at the door. What's happened? Are you okay? Nothing happened. Ultimately, we broke the door open. And there she was sitting with her eyes closed, howling. We said, Baby, what has happened? She didn't say anything, kept on crying. So we ran to Great Master's house, which was right across, and told him the baby is crying. He immediately came with us, came and saw, said, baby, why are you crying? She spoke to him, to nobody else. She said, I am in hell. What do you mean hell? Where are you? She described the torture being given to people, who human beings like us, and how they were being tortured there and suffering and pain. Great master said, baby, are they hurting you? She said, no, then why are you crying? She said, I can't see what, how much pain and suffering these people are going through. They said, how did you go there? Out of curiosity, just said, I might, now that I am there, I might as well see. And then he said, can you hear it? Why don't you repeat your simran they gave you? And she said, I forgot the simran. There's so much pain. He said, can you hear my voice? She said, I can hear your voice. She said, follow my voice and come out. And then she opened her eyes, put her head on his feet. And then the great master told us, this can sometimes happen. If you start roaming around the astral plane without the guidance of your master, you can go into negative territory. Please never do that. He advised us that when you are withdrawing your attention from the physical body, you are able to float around and fly anywhere. You fly in a new dimension all over, but try to first reach the point which is higher up in that inner sky where you will see the radiant astral form of your master. If you go with the master, you never go wrong. So try to first go to the radiant form of the master, then explore those words as much as you like. There's a safe thought for you. So advise us after the experience that we have. That is why. It's important to use the empowered words he gives us and also use them to avoid this negative kind of experience which can happen if you go unguided. So, but these experiences are beautiful. If you meditate from within and go into the causal plane, you will find something very interesting. The whole secret of the law of karma will be exposed to you. How does karma work? How did we create karma? 
when soul first came, soul has no karma, ever, not even now. Only mind has karma. Karma is all in time and space is only in the mind, not on the soul at all. We are souls, so we have no real karma. But when we wear the mind, we get subject to the karma. When we first came into this physical world of values, we had no karma, then how was the life created? That question is answered in the causal play. When we have what is called a causal series, that means a causal body, the mind, and we can study what the mind is at that stage. There you will find that we ourselves picked up a life pattern built on the basis of karma of previous lives, which we never lived. We looked at several life patterns. It's almost like going to a store and picking up a DVD. A DVD is a recorded life. It's not playing. It's recorded in one place, one time. We pick it up and we play it. It's exactly the same way we picked up one life and we came here. That life had to be sustained by a previous life, by the law of karma for the defect. Therefore, there was a previous life attached to that, to the one life we came in. We picked up one life, previous life we never lived. But was as soon as we entered one life, it became our past life. That past life had to have another past life. You can go on to infinite past lives for one life. Infinite future lives. Oh, that's how we picked up and came in this time. And we came for one life that we have a little time, enjoy one life, two lives, ten, twenty, which we like to enjoy and go back. But once we came here to make this real, the reality, we cut off our connection, hidden inside our own self, and began to look at the outside world and get attached to that. And get so much desiring and attaching to the mind outside, it totally would be forgot that we came only temporarily to have this experience. This secret can be revealed to you right in the, within yourself through meditation for the inner body of the causal mind. It's all right there. So you will find the secret that the soul has no karma, did not have before, does not have today, and it's the mind we are wearing that carries the karma, and mind has a long life to carry so many lifetimes of karma and we come with that. But once we are here and then we die, then the next life, the last life becomes the real lived life. So we can stay on as long as we like depending upon what, what single life we chose. We can choose a life and see, okay, after ten lives, there is a possibility of going home and become that. Even that is pre-recorded. If it's a DVD, it's pre-recorded that we will one day become seekers. And one day we made an arrangement that even with the DVD, we have provision for coming back to our true home by somebody coming and telling us, oh, within, this is not your place. That's part of the DVD. So when that time comes, we automatically become seekers. We have the experience of seeking. Now the strange thing is, out of Chirashita, 8.4 million forms of life, including angels, the only form, one form, which can feel I decide things is a human form. I have free will. I can decide what I like. This feeling is in no other form of life. You can look at all the forms of life here. Nobody is thinking what to decide, they live. They live according to the built program, instinctively. Their DNA is dictating everything. No plants think, no birds think, nobody thinking and deliberating or saying, now I have a choice, should I do this or not do this? Is it good or is it bad? Nobody is thinking except human being. Now, not even angels, because they know the future. They are also drifting according to a fixed pattern. Everything, every form of life is going according to its pattern, already developed and pre-written completely. The script is completely written, including that for the human beings. But the human beings have been made ignorant of the future. And this ignorance is bliss because then we feel we decide. The script is not of our actions, 
script is of our thoughts. How we will think and decide is very little. I was very strangely awakened to this back when I was young. I had gone, I might have told this story earlier, I had gone for an interview to join the Indian Navy in India. After the interview, they came out of the interview. My brother got in the Navy, I got selected in the Navy, but because two, two of us didn't have to go, my parents suggested let him go, you go to the civil service, which I went later. But after I came out for the interview, a gentleman with a turban and a beard accosted me and said, good luck. I said, why are you speaking in English? We are both Punjabis, we can talk in Indian language. He said, no, I see good luck, therefore I say, then wait, wait, do you have any piece of paper? I said, yes, I have a piece of paper, I will carry papers for my interview. I gave him a little piece of that page, little piece of paper he cut, and said, you have a pen? Here is my pen. He looked into my eyes and began to write something. I don't know what he is writing. Then he said, fold this paper two times and make it small and hold in your hand like this. I had this paper. I don't know what he is doing. Then he said, have another paper now and you write the answer to the question I am going to ask you. He said, write a number between 1 and 10. I said, this is an old trick. We used to play with the kids. <laughs> write number between 1 and 10. We all wrote 5 in the middle number. And he is imagining I will write 5. I am not going to write 5. I am going to call off his bluff. So I wrote 3. He said, write the name of a flower. Rose was the most common flower people were writing. A gulab, a rose. I said, no, this, this interview is taking place in like, now, another state, not Punjab. I said, I'll write a name that he may not have ever heard of. So I wrote Chameli, C-H-A-M-E-L-I. He said, write your date of birth. So I wrote 1926. He said, that's not your date of birth, that is the year of birth. So I wrote, and after 1926, I wrote 11, 26. Normally we write the other way around, but I had written the year earlier. He said, now open the paper I gave you. He opened the papers. He said, three, Chameli, exactly spelled in the same capitals, and 1926, then 1126, the same order. I was completely taken aback. He wrote that paper before I even thought of my answers. He, he not... You know, I'm guessing reading my mind because he had written before I the thought. How can he answer this? I was so surprised. How can he answer those questions before he asked me, before I thought of the answers? When I was still shocked, he said, shall I tell you a little more? I said, please go ahead. He said, when I asked you to write a number between one and five, you thought, he thinks I will write five, I am going to call off his bluff, and you wrote three, he repeated my thought. <laughs> and when I asked you to write the name of a flower, and you said he thinks I am going to write rose, I will write a name he had never heard of, and I write Chabeli. He repeated my thought. Similarly about the date of birth. I said, how could you have known these thoughts came to me after he wrote this paper. He explained that he fought for a group of people, they were Bhatras. Bhatras were practicing this kind of experiences to read people's mind as it will happen five minutes later. First time I realized that even our thoughts are being determined and being recorded. The first evidence I ever got that what you will think and the way you decide things is pretty recorded already in some way. Otherwise, you couldn't have read it from anywhere. So, but if you go to meditation and reach the causal plane, you will find everything, all your thoughts, all decision making is pre written. The only beauty is that when you are in a physical body, you can't see that pre written. You think, I am deciding now. 
and therefore you get the feeling you have a free will. A wonderful gift. Ignorance has blessed us with this wonderful gift that we think we can decide. If we did not have this gift, we could never have the experience of seeking. Seeking is the secret of finding the truth. And therefore, you would never become seekers. And this special gift of ignorance of the future has made us seekers of the future. And therefore, we think we find by seeking a perfect living master who the guides us. We don't realize this all very little in our destiny. Therefore, this experience is only a mental experience given in the physical and astral self only. Very limited in the astral self, but very full in the physical body. Very little in the dreams, very little in the astral self, none in the causal plane. Only physical body, full feeling. I decide what I have to do. You say my, uh, my destiny is to go right, I will go left. And then I look up, my destiny says, you will say, destiny says, go right, I will go left. Pre-recorded. So that is why everything is pre-recorded. But we are given this wonderful opportunity to feel we are seeking. And that is why human life is the most important life for going back home. Because seeking is only possible in this life out of 8.4 million forms of life. It's a very great thing to be a human being, to have this facility. And as a human being, we have been given the facility of being endowed with consciousness, life, with awareness, with attention, with power of imagination. What else do we do? need? These are the things required to go in and go within and find the truth. We all have that gift. From a child of five years old, old man of hundred years old can follow this path. No restriction. No restriction of country, religion, culture. You may belong to any place. So long as you are a human being, you have the ability to go within and find out the truth. And what, what will happen? When you are seeking and are ready, a perfect living master will appear in your life automatically. You can't find it. Nobody can find perfect living master. For a very simple reason, a perfect living master does not have to say he is a perfect living master. Never says it. He does not have to dress in a particular way to appear like a master. He does not have to wear saffron colored robes or yellow colored robes or black colored robes or wear no robes. He does not have any of these things because he does not have to show off. He will be just as ordinary as we are. Absolutely ordinary person at the same level as we are because, now that's the secret part I was going to mention. Because to go beyond the mind to our true home, no effort can take us. But only something that is beyond the physical, <coughs> mental world can take us. And there are three things <coughs> that happen to us which are beyond the mind. And we all experience them. First is love. Brain is not, does not come through thinking as by space and time. It just comes. Second is intuition, the subtle knowledge that we get. Third is the appreciation of beauty and the experience of joy from that, the blissful feeling that does not come by thinking. It comes spontaneously. These three things come from the soul directly, not the, not the mind. That is why both soul and mind are operating in our life all the time. But we are listening more to the mind and not to the soul, to ourselves. Therefore, what a perfect living master does in our life is he comes at the right time which we have pre-selected at the time of picking up the DVD in the causal play. He appears at that time and draws us from the mind above through his love. Nothing else. This tell me, let me tell you the spiritual path is of love and devotion alone. Not of meditation. Meditation is to go to these planes, as I mentioned. Meditation can take you to realize that you have an inner body living thousands of years. You have a mind living for billions of years. You can go and see that. That you can do. With some guidance, not to go to negative territories, 
with the guidance of any guru who has gone there, you can find peace. There are thousands of gurus, maybe millions today in this world. Great master used, used to say, the number of gurus is growing so fast, now there are more gurus than disciples. <laughs> Every place is a great business. Guru Sita has become a great business. Perfect giving masters have never charged anything for this service. It's always free for them. They don't come to be takers, they come for givers. They give freely. So that is why they are very different from all the gurus who make it a business. But he says, gurus can take you to certain places. And they can give you those experiences. No guru can take you beyond where he is born. Because that's his such kind. That is true home. You know, and you can't blame him. Because he has experienced only that. A large number of people have thought that when we withdraw attention, we find the soul. As the body is being called the soul. The soul is reincarnating. Soul never reincarnates. It's the astral self that reincarnates, move from one body to another. So these mistaken notions are there, and it does not mean that we will only find a perfect living master. We don't even seek that. Sometimes we seek just one experience, out of body experience. So masters come at that level. Many masters can come into our life. I'll tell you another true story of another disciple of great master, which I have already told earlier many times, but you may not have heard. There was one gentleman named Trilok Chand. Trilok Chand was an engineer for buildings and roads. He worked in the roads department in Burma, which is now called Myanmar. Myanmar, he was uh, in Rangoon and in many old places, and he was very great seeker of truth. Any swami or yogi or anybody would come, he would go and meet them. But he was never satisfied that they are giving him what he wants. So, one friend of his from India told him, there is one swami in Madras. Now, for Chennai, it used to be called Madras, the city. There is one swami in Madras. He has the power to give you particular mantras and teach you method of meditation that gives you true absolute true true realization of yourself and your true form. So, the Rokchan was a person who would not spend too much. At that time, the Indian rupee was also the currency in Burma. So, by his hard work and his saving habit, he collected 30,000 rupees. His method was, every time he had to spend money, he would take out a rupee note and look at it, say to spend or not to spend. And he would say not to spend and put it in. <laughs> that is how he earned a small job where a road engineer was able to gather 30,000 rupees. He sold everything, put that 30,000 rupees with him, came to Madras. and met the Swamiji and friend and told him. Swamiji said to Lok Ram, have you heard the story of King Janak? Now, he said, yes sir, I have. Have you all heard the story of King Janak? Anybody not heard the story of King Janak? Some of you have. I repeat it, don't mind if others have you heard it before. King Janak was also a king of India and he was very dear seeker. So he asked his ministers and advisors, I want to find the ultimate true knowledge. Where will I find it? And the minister and the advisor said, King Janak, you are very lucky you have been born in a country which has got so many yogis, swamis, gurus. Just have a young, a holy feast. And they will all come to it. And then you can ask them questions. They will give you true knowledge. So he held a big holy festival and put up tents in his palace. And hundreds of yogi swamis came Good food was served, kheer was also served, which is a favorite, rice pudding. So, uh, that's just an aside. <laughs> <laughs> but the king disguised himself incognito and he walked like a tourist amongst them. And he was surprised to see the ego and haughtiness of those people, all claiming they know more and arguing with the 
yogi next to them, Argi Swami, you don't know, holding the same scripture in their hand, Argi, my interpretation is correct, not yours. Some arguing so violently they came into blows. He said, these people who can't control their anger even, what kind of knowledge do they have? They are not even at peace with each other. And so much ego they have. This is what I was looking for. Disappointed, he came back to his palace and he told the, his advisors, this was not the kind of knowledge he wanted. They said, this was only one day affair. We did not call all the yogis and swamis of the country. Now a beat of drum announces the whole country had a seven day feast. So seven day feast was organized and King Janak again disguised himself like an ordinary tourist and moved among and saw the same drama repeated in more tents in for seven days. He said, this is what I was looking for. Very disappointed, he came back to his palace and his advisors said, King, what you are looking for, these people will not give you. King said, they are learned people. They know their scriptures by heart. They can repeat their scriptures, they can speak Veda, they can speak Gita's from heart. But they don't have the knowledge I am looking for. I am looking for instant knowledge of myself. They said, in that case, Master the the master who can give you that knowledge, the guru who can give you that knowledge, will not come to your party. Where is he? He says he is living on the bank of the river and his name is Ashtabak. Ashta means eight. Bakar was the bank on his knees. He was hunchback. Seven, eight, eight backs, hunched like this. And so his name was called Ashtabak. King said, why didn't you tell me first? So he quickly went to the hut of Ashtabak and stood there and Ashtabaka got up, a majesty king, what has brought you here? He said, I have not come as a king, I have come as a beggar for real knowledge. I want you to come to my palace and give me real knowledge and to my colleagues there. He said, you have invited me, I will certainly come. So a date and time was fixed and he arrived in the conference hall of his palace. A big gathering, all the nobility, other neighboring kings, he invited everybody. All the royalty nobility was present. Ashtabhakar, along with seven or eight of his followers, came. He took off their shoes at the entrance, which was their custom. And as he walked, the people looked at this hunchback guy coming. They said, Who are the king invited to give us real knowledge? This fellow, this fellow, look at his body. He he going to give us real knowledge. They were murmuring to each other. So on the stage there were two chairs placed, one for the Ashtabhakar, the guru, one for the king. So king welcomed him and made him sit there. Ashtabhakar said, King, what is the price of leather today? The king said, what is leather to do with this? I invited you to give us true knowledge. He said, are we not leather, leather merchants sitting here? No, no, no. These are nobility, royalty, they've come to hear you. They are not leather merchants. Mr. Bhakar said, the way they looked at my body and my skin, I thought maybe they deal with skin. So the audience realized he has some sense of humor. So they kept quiet. And Mr. Bhakar said, what kind of knowledge do you want? He said, I want instant knowledge. By the way, which makes me think, Ashtar Bhakar was an American in his past life. <laughs> the world was everything in script. <laughs> anyway, that's an aside. So, he said, even an instant, Ashtar Bhakar said, even an instant is some time. How much time is an instant? He said, when I go horse riding, from the time I put my foot, the spirit I sit on the saddle, that is one instant. He said, okay, for that instant knowledge you have to pay a price. King said, any price you quote, my coffers are open, my treasury is open, name the price that will be given to you. He said, I want three things. He said, you can take 10, 20, whatever you want. I want three things. Give me your body, give me your wealth, and give me your mind. If you can give these three, I will give you instant knowledge. Now this was a very strange price tag, but King Janak was a real seeker. 
He said, I surrender to you, Master. My body is yours. My, all my wealth is yours. My mind is also yours. Now give me knowledge. I said, Bhakta, are you sure you've given them to me? He said, yes, Master, they are yours. He said, now this body is mine. I can keep it where I like. Yes, Master. He said, King, get up from this chair of yours. Go and sit on my shoes, which are lying right on the door. Again, there was a lot of murmur in the crowd. What kind of knowledge is this guy coming, the hunchback coming, telling the king to go and sit on the shoes? In this kind of knowledge, we have to come to here. So, as the king got up and walked, he said, These people don't know what I am looking for. They are looking at my wealth. I am the king. I have got so many palaces. And what am I going sitting on the shoes? As this thought came to him, Ashtabhuka shouted from the stage, King, you have no business to think of your wealth. You gave it to me. He said, oh, I forgot. The wealth is not mine anymore. I, I, how, how can I, how am I thinking about that? And this thought came, Ashtabhaka shouted, you can't even think what you can think or not. Your mind is mine. <laughs> Ashtabhaka put his hands on his head. You know, the king put his hands on his head like this. I can't even think. <laughs> At that moment he got enlightened. Because when he stopped thinking, there was no thought. Ashtabhaka with his grace gave him that. He said, like, yeah, don't, don't have to sit on the shoes, come back. And he said, sit down. Tell me, did you get instant knowledge? He said, yes, I did. Was it a less than instant? He said, it was less than instant that I got it. Ashtabhaka said, King, I don't need your body. I'm taking care of my old body. I certainly don't need your wealth. I'm very happy where I am. And certainly I don't need your mind. I try to help with my own mind and controlling them. Therefore, you keep them, but use them as if they belong to me. From today, think that your body belongs to a worker, your wealth belongs to a worker, your mind belongs to a worker. And in the course of some years, you will be able to get the same knowledge by a permanent basis. That's just a glimpse he gave him. So this is the old story of King Janak and Ashtabhakar. So the Lokchan was asked by the Swami in Sandai Madras, have you heard the story? He said, yes sir, I have heard the story. He said, I follow the same rule that Ashtabhakar follows. Give me your wealth, give me your body, give me your mind, I'll give you true knowledge. He says, if King Janak would do it, I am only the Lokchan. Okay, my body is yours, my wealth is yours, my mind is yours. He said, let's talk about the wealth first. <laughs> How many do you have? He said, I collected 30,000 rupees. I have collected them. They are with me. He said, deposit them in my account. I have to start building a temple. I was waiting for some good guy like you to come. <laughs> so now my temple will start. He said, now, your body, I have to teach you how to do pranayama, breathing exercises, according to the rituals I was taught and you have to practice, which means you have to have breathing alternating. One breath from the right nostril and second breath in and out, left nostril. And you cannot use these fingers of yours for that. Because if you use your hand and fingers, your attention will go out. Two climb inside, not outside. Therefore, you have to use your tongue inside. And to use your tongue, you have to reverse the tongue and the tendons will have to be cut so the tongue can go out and he said I had to do it the Swami opened his mouth the tongue was like a snake coming out he said this is how to turn the tongue in and he said since it is a sacrifice on the body I will not go to the simple surgery I will scrub it not only with sandpaper I will use uh, there is a metal rash called Vichu Bhuti which is very stingy I will use that and it will be torture. One month the Lokshan went through this torture. And every day he used to do that. And he said, I have to find the truth. Then after this ordeal was done, he taught him how to do pranayama by reversing the tongue. And he used to see some lights and some colors and all that, but he didn't see what he wanted to see. So he said, Swamiji, I am not getting what I came for. Swami said, that's all I can give. 
in the end that experience you have had, that's all in my hands, you have to go to somebody else for anything more. So the Lokchand went through other swamis, eventually he found Great Master. And Great Master initiated him. Because of all his practice, he made very rapid progress there. In the evening, Great Master used to sometimes have a small group of people where the Lokchand was present in one meeting, I was there, my father was there, some other people were there. Close meetings he used to have, just a small, a small family. There the Lokchand said to Great Master, Master, had I known that you are the real master who can give me true answers and true knowledge, I would not have given that 30,000 rupees to this one. <laughs> and mine was still on the 30,000 <laughs> Great Master laughed and said, The Lokchand, you don't know. The day you came to me, I transferred those 30,000 rupees to my account. <laughs> and then he explained to us, he says, never think that you have gone to a wrong guru. You have always gone to the right guru that you needed at that time. But if your seeking continues, after that, you're not satisfied, you will be met by a guru who will take you further. <coughs> Eventually, if your seeking is still not satisfied, you will meet the perfect living master who will take you back to true home. Therefore, never get worried. Oh, I went to fake master, I went to wrong master, I right? never think like that. All the masters are doing their jobs and bringing you up at a certain point. He said four masters are mentioned even in the you know, scriptures. First master, first guru is your mother teaches you how to grow up. Second is your school teacher. Third is the religious teacher of the church or temple. Fourth is the spiritual teacher. These four are already mentioned. So these gurus come one by one in their stages. In spiritual teachers, you can have several depending upon what stage your thinking is and when you are there. Now when they say the there is a saying when Chela is ready, Guru appears. When a disciple is ready, the master appears. They don't say when a Chela is ready, he will find a master. They say he will appear, which is true. You can't find a perfect living master because there are no signs on his forehead. There is no sign of his dress. There is no sign of any kind. He's just an ordinary person like us. That is why you can't find him. But he can find us. He will appear and your mind will create doubts for some time. But the love, the pull of love of the perfect living master will override the doubts of your mind. Because the love of a perfect living master is different from any love you have experienced. It is totally unconditional. It has no judgment whatsoever. A perfect living master never judges what your karma is, how good or bad you are. He only sees your soul is seeking to go back to home and he appears and take you back home. A perfectly master's job is very simple. This soul is ready to go back home and he operates from the home and he takes you back to your true home. That's the role of a perfectly master. He's not a teacher. He's not even teaching meditation. He's doing it for our mind. Our mind cannot accept that we can get anything without our effort. He said, all right, put an effort. More effort. Two and a half hour meditation. Very difficult to do. Two and a half. You haven't done enough. Do more. So all this is for the mind. And this effort can take us up to a certain point. The love of the perfect living master, starting from here, takes us even beyond the causal plane into spiritual regions. Great master used to say, his spiritual thought starts in all realm, beyond the mind, to such kind of true home. From the individual soul to a totality, that's his spiritual path. That can only be traversed by love and love and devotion. Prem or bhakti. Why two words are used? Love comes from the master, unalloyed, pure. And when love touches our soul, we become devotees automatically. The devotion comes automatically. That is why two words are used, love and devotion. The whole secret of the spiritual path is love and devotion. It's love and devotion that will take us there. Somebody asked me once, 
if one has no doubt and has full love and devotion and full faith, then they need to do meditation. My answer was very clear, no. Faith, love and devotion, unshakable faith, love and devotion are enough to take you to a true home. But the mind doesn't accept it. Okay, then meditate. Have some meditation. Because if you see some thought, mind begins to believe. Whether whether it doubts. Alright, put the mind to work. Do meditation with the mind and see the inner astral self of ours. There's a whole new world there opening up. Go to the causal plane, see destinies being made. See how time and space are being generated there. See the secrets of creation. And then your mind will believe it. Tell it all for the mind. The soul does not need any of these. Soul only needs love. And love pulls the soul. So that is why the secret they keep with us is that the master do not pull us with meditation, they pull us with soul. Meditation becomes necessary because of our minds. And the way we have made masters, mind our own masters. We have been guided by mind. Mind has a, as I said, built in doubt. And doubt creates fear. And doubt and fear creates so much insecurity in our lives. Imagine but for our mind we wouldn't be having any fear. Any disciple who has crossed the mind has no fear whatsoever, no doubt whatsoever. To have a life in this physical plane with no doubt, no doubt and no fear itself is a miracle. And that miracle is possible just by following the teachings of a perfect living master. I have shared these things, shared all these things from my experience of the teachings of this perfect living master, Hadur Maharaj Baba Sahib Singh. They have worked for me. Therefore, I am sharing with you. If they have not worked for, it, for me, I would not have shared them with you. I do not want to be hypocrite and say, oh, I know this if I don't know it. These perfect living masters who have come, here is one example, he is not living now. He passed away, but there is always a perfect living master available in this world. Always. For seekers, for seeking the ultimate truth. They will appear in your life. There are some simple signs, not definitive signs, but simple signs. Perfect living masters never say they are masters. They become friends. They become friends and we experience their strange love, unconditional love with no judgment, which is very strange. A perfect living master will love you if you love him. He will love you if you hate him. He will love you if you kill him. That's the kind of love you experience or a perfect living master. Very big difference. So secondly, they do not perform public street miracles, but they perform plenty of private miracles in our lives. That's another big thing. They will never charge any fee or any kind of money for their services. It's always free. These are some of the very basic things that you will find. And their message will be to our soul. We will be touched by that. We don't even sometimes know why they are pulling us. There was a professor, an intellectual professor, who came to meet Master one Sunday on the weekend. And he said, Master, I have come to tell you something. What you are teaching is all wrong. There are no higher stages. This is the only life we live. And you are misleading all these people. I have come to request you, please don't mislead people, don't tell them these things. Great Master said, Professor, I appreciate your honesty in expressing your opinion. Your experience is different from mine. I am going by my experience, which is different. I have, you have a right to have your views and your experience. I have my right. We can agree to differ. No harm. Professor said, okay, and he went away. Next week, and he was back. And he said, Master, I have come again to tell you that what you are teaching people is all made up. The gurus have all made up the stories. And the scriptures have been written by these interested people setting up religions. And this is not truth at all. Please don't waste the time of these people who are all coming to listen to you. And therefore, stop this kind of discourse that you are giving. Okay, Master said, last week also you came and I said the same thing. You have a right to your opinion based on your experience. I 
have the right to, to follow what I have experienced. My experience is not the same as yours. So we can differ in this thing. The professor went to him. Third of the weekend he was back again. And he said the same thing. The headmaster said, Professor, you told us the same thing twice earlier. If you come the third time, why is that? He said, I don't know, but I feel like coming to you anyway. <laughs> that is what happens. The man who was advising great master not to say that was being pulled by the master. And once initiated, he became one of the great disciples. My good friend of mine. So I am only telling you how masters pull us. It is not with their talk. It is not with their discourses. All the discourses are written in books. The same thing you can read. Same thing so many people have said. Same thing anybody can repeat. It's not the words. It's that strange love that comes from radiates from them. It affects our soul. And we can't even understand it because the mind does not mind want to understand what can I do to get something? What is what is my role in this thing? So it's all the time mind wants to find what action it can perform, what it can do to get things. And this is something the mind cannot get. We have to cross the mind to go to our true home. And that can only come when we are ready. Readiness means we are fed up of the experience here. If we are still fond of experience here, we are not ready. First sign will be, I am fed up. This is not my word. I, I don't belong here. This feeling should come. If that feeling hasn't come, we are not ready yet. Let's take our time. One man came to me. He said, you are talking of our trying to run away somewhere, escape from this world. I have a beautiful house. I have a lot of money. I bought a new car. You can see it outside. I had a good life. Why should I go inside and look for something? I said, no, you don't have to. Go enjoy. Ride your car. I also come from the ride with you. Your time for enjoying this world is there, not for going with it. Next week he came back again. I said, are you having a good time? He says, no, I am having the worst time. I said, what happened in one week? He said, firstly, my wife left me. I found out she was in love with somebody else. My heart can't forgive her for that. I am so distressed. My money is no value in this thing. The pain I am suffering, nobody can take care of it. I said, did you see that this is... This can happen in one week. He said, now I want to go in and find out the truth. He said, one week you change your own mind. Therefore, we sometimes ourselves cannot know when we are ready. But when we come across the perfect living master, and when we are ready, we know this is not our place. We have had enough of it. And that's the sign of readiness. And when we are ready, the perfect living master accepts us and says, I take you back home. That process is called initiation. And it's only an acceptance way, Master. Initiation does not mean teaching you how to meditate. Anybody can teach you. Anybody, in written books, you can follow them. To how to meditate, there are so many books available in every language. But the initiation by a perfectly Master means your time has come, I will take you back home. And he fulfills his promise without any, any break, guaranteed. That is the word of a perfect living master. Initiation does not take place by words outside, it takes place inside where the master manifests himself and is with you at all times. I am very grateful for your patience in listening to me and I would uh, like to answer any questions when I come back after this lunch break. Uh, if you have uh, any paper ready for please do they have paper pencil ready for writing questions? Okay, if you have any questions on anything I have said this morning, or anything I have not said, or not a question but an answer, or a comment, you can write it. I will try to answer as many as I can at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you very much for your patience.